Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 193 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guest is Dr. Eric Dorninger, and the topic of the show is actinos as a root cause of SIRS. Dr. Eric Dorninger is a registered naturopathic doctor and licensed acupuncturist. He graduated from Bastyr University, the leading accredited university for science-based natural medicine. Prior to medical school, he received his BA in kinesiology from the University of Colorado Boulder in 1997, and during this time, he also finished his emergency medical technician training and volunteered at Porter Care Hospice in Denver. This dual exposure of medical perspectives laid down the roots for Dr. Dorninger's integrated approach to diagnosis, treatment, and healing. Following undergrad, Dr. Dorninger served as an EMT for the Cranford First Aid Squad in Cranford, New Jersey. He then completed his doctorate in naturopathic medicine and his master's degree in acupuncture at Bastyr University in 2003, after which he returned to Boulder, Colorado to complete a two-year residency in naturopathic primary care. In 2005, Dr. Dorninger founded Roots and Branches Integrative Healthcare, a clinic dedicated to mystery illness, where he focuses on elucidating the underlying causes of unrelenting chronic illness. Dr. Dorninger is not concerned with what you have as much as he is with why you have it. He's dedicated his professional life to a deeper understanding of differential diagnosis based in the tradition of remove obstacles to cure. After the 2013 floods in Boulder, Dr. Dorninger noticed that patients who were initially getting better suddenly regressed, and patients he was struggling to diagnose got worse. Fortunately, he was guided to the honest, data-driven, peer-reviewed, reproducible, published work of Dr. Richie Shoemaker on mold and biotoxin illness in 2014. Dr. Dorninger signed on for his Shoemaker certification training. He is a certified shoemaker practitioner and remains true to the shoemaker protocol. According to Dr. Dorninger, diagnosing underlying causes and facilitating accurate treatment plans is a grind. At roots and branches, he embraces the grind. In addition to private practice, Dr. Dorninger teaches functional medicine for Apex Energetics, practices jujitsu, skis, and enjoys watching his biotoxin, genetically susceptible kids, thrive post chronic inflammatory response syndrome treatment and now my interview with dr eric dorninger i am excited today to dig into a topic that i found of much personal interest but not been able to find a lot of clear information about to date that is actinos as a root cause of SIRS. thanks for being here my pleasure First, talk to us a little about your personal connection to SIRS and to biotoxin illness. Why did you choose to make treating SIRS a major focus of your work? What drives your passion today? Yeah, I want to, a lot of people have heard my story, so maybe I'll, I'll give a little bit extra insight. Mrs. Sabrata, my sixth grade teacher, gave me a book on Albert Schweitzer, and she thought I was going to be a doctor. And um, for those of you who don't know Albert Schweitzer, he was a great philanthropist, medical doctor who could play these beautiful concertos and would raise money all over Europe and then set up clinics in Africa for uh, depri- uh, healthcare deprived regions and really s- served the, the rest of his life. And I read the story of Albert Schweitzer and I remember just being enamored with service work. And then I thought I wanted to be a firefighter for a while. I would rescue every, every cat in the neighborhood and thought I wanted to be a vet. And at the end of the day, all I wound up being is the party captain at my last years in high school and at my first couple of years at CU. And then I went through my own healthcare crisis and I'll spare you the nitty gritty details on that. But I basically dropped to my knees and asked God to stay on this planet. And I had, I did the classics of counseling, of grieving, anger, bargaining, and I made my contract to make sure that if I got to stay on this earth, that I would help others. I had to, I was having massive arrhythmia and I went to a conservative ER emergency room in Denison, Ohio. And I said, I'm just going to try honesty out 
for my life. And I told the nurse everything I've been doing, everything I've been polluting my body with. And she said, serves you right. The cardiologist will be right in with you. Did a 180 click out of the room. I was like, that's what I get for telling the truth. <laughs> like, All right. <laughs> no compassion for you. And the, the cardiologist came in. He said, the good news is you didn't have a heart attack. You had a massive arrhythmia. You got to be careful. And I said, well, I'm ready. What should I do to take care of my heart and my health? And he said, don't drink, don't smoke, don't eat spicy foods. And I was like, that's it. And at the time, I was dating Brigitte Mars, a renowned herbalist daughter, Rainbow Mars, and had access to Brigitte's library. And I would read everything about constituents of herbal medicine and the most hardcore, beautiful biochemical constituents of herbs and how to apply them. And then I would read a book on like how a Chinese practitioner would read the soul of a shoe to make a diagnosis and everything in between. It was like being in like the Hogwarts of integrated medicine in, in her in her library. I started talking to friends about my healthcare experiences and I shared a vision of what healthcare should and could be to a platonic girlfriend of mine, Bonnie. And she goes, yeah, that's called naturopathic medicine. There's a school for that in Seattle and, and Portland, Oregon and Arizona. I had to clean up my grades. I had my sense of purpose, which I think is the most concerning thing for our youth is they don't have a sense of purpose. Young young men are extremely dangerous without a sense of purpose, and they just have too much testosterone and power. And if they don't know how to build things, they'll destroy things. I was talking to her about, you know, why didn't they help me understand my heart and figure out how to take care of my heart and yada, yada, yada. I went on this thing called the internet, right? And it had Bastyr University, the address, the telephone number, National uh, College of Naturopathic Medicine, which is now National University in Southwest. And I got my swag bag and I started getting exposed to J Joe, Joe Bazurna was doing such a good job promoting the therapeutic order, which was really, um, uh, he's incredible, but it was on, on the backs of Jared Zeff and Pam Schneider and some of the old guard who was carrying the principles of naturopathic medicine, holding that very delicate flame the number one step in a therapeutic order is remove obstacle to cure. And you can say it in an old school voice, right? Remove obstacle to cure. But we have modified it or modernized it to identify and treat the underlying causes, right? And I saw that and the clouds parted and I said, this, this is what I want to do. The patient always knows what they have. They have a headache, right? Migraine, migraine means half head pain. So you tell the, the doctor that your head hurts and they tell you in Greek, your head hurts, right? Fibromyalgia. You tell the doctor your muscles hurt. Yeah. And they say, yeah, fibromyalgia. You say, yeah, I have Google. I looked that up. Algae means pain and mouth problems and muscle fiber. So I just told you in plain English, my muscles hurt. And you told me in Greek, your muscles hurt, right? Now let's pick on the nature paths. Adrenal fatigue. No, I will do a dexamethasone challenge and I will get cortisol out of those thyroid adrenal glands. Your adrenals are not fatigued. You can have dysregulation, hypothalamus pituitary uh, dysregulation, where inflammation from some source is corrupting the brain adrenal axis signaling of morning cortisol. But if you have adrenal fatigue, you better show me 21 hydroxylase or anti-adrenal autoantibodies and Addison's. That is a true tired adrenal. Most of our patients. So, so I started, you know, challenge everything mostly politely. I realized I have to clean up my act. My grades suck. And I was asking some colleagues like, okay, I know I got to get straight A's and blah, 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 and pass organic chemistry, but what can I do? And someone recommended volunteering hospice looks really good on a resume. And then that University of Colorado Boulder offered an EMT emergency room training uh, and riding with the ambulance through Longmont United, just, just north of, of CU. And I did those two things and those changed my life because they showed me the best of conventional model. It was ironic that I was helping people die with dignity during the day, and I was doing everything in my power to make sure someone didn't die with my nights. So I got to see the best of conventional model, and I really struggled between emergency room medicine, because I thought I wanted to be an ER doc, and naturopathic medicine. And what I realized is that the ER does a great job making sure we don't die today. It's extraordinary. It's brilliant. It's amazing. It deserves celebration bring them a nice gluten-free cake and say, thank you for all your hard work. But then they just discharge you to your chronic illness and not enough healthcare providers were there to pick that up. And that's why I, I, I went to Bastyr. Unfortunately, I fell butt backwards into some of the best mentorships where people are still looking for the underlying cause. 
and the modern integrative functional medicine practitioner is getting vulnerable to modality selling and supplement sales rather than drilling down for underlying causes. And we need to use our brains to say, these could be the 100 reasons you have a headache. And then we need to use validated data. Call your medical directors and challenge them on clinical validation of the labs you're ordering if you're an integrated practitioner. And then you order the data to say, yes, it is, or yes, it is not participating in that headache. And total load, the other thing I fell in love with with naturopathic medicine was multifactorial causes of a headache, right? It's not a straw that breaks the camel's back. It is all the straws. And that's where naturopathic medicine really got me out of this. You know, we found penicillin, it gets rid of strep. So everything must have a drug for symptom solution, right? With no side effects, right? So that's nonsense. So that's kind of my journey to getting into my next chapter, which is biotoxin illness. So to provide some context then for listeners, we're going to talk today about actinomycetes or actinos as a contributor to SIRS or chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Actinos are gram-positive bacteria common in soil, in and on humans, also in indoor environments. They do have some overlapping characteristics with fungi as they produce mycelium. They also produce spores, as I understand. More recently, Dr. Shoemaker said that actinos may account for 42% of the contribution to SIRS, endotoxins 28%. Even more recently, I've been learning about beta-glucans, possibly 23% of the contributor, and mold and mycotoxins, surprisingly, only now 7%. So wondering if you can talk to us a bit about the shift from SIRS being more mold and mycotoxin triggered to now being more bacteria and endotoxin triggered. Is this still mold illness? So you probably know Dr. Scott McMahon, my bestie and brother of another mother. We co-founded SIRSAX, which is basically carrying the flame of Mold Congress and, and the surviving mold conferences, because running a conference is a real pain in the keister. You don't get paid for it. It's, it's hundreds of hours of volunteer work. But we had to keep a rigorous academic challenge conference going where people can bring data, everyone can learn, mull over it. Uh, chew on it, so on and so forth. So I have the privilege of being in the inner circle of Dr. Richie Shoemaker. And I will tell you, sometimes he doesn't share in one concise statement what's been going on over the last 10 years. So this concept of mold is the only cause of CIRS in a building envelope is something he's never felt. He's talked about endotoxin, which is sewer gas, poop, caca, stool, dookie, manure, uh, doo-doo, for 20 years. He's talked about water-damaged building bacteria known as actinobacteria, which actinomycetes is one of those, for 20 years. He didn't have commercial testing to evaluate the building, so he couldn't test his theories. What we had is the ERMI and the HERTSME to evaluate for water-damaged building molds. Fast forward... And PCR, which is the similar technology for ERMI, PCR is quantitative polymerase chain reaction, is basically the same technology they use on Law & Order with Ice-T and Olivia Benson for finding out who done it. And is it uh, Jimmy's sperm cell or hair cell or someone's skin cell where you amplify DNA? But Steve Vesper, the EPA, said, let's see if we can amplify the DNA of water damage building molds and, and traditional soil molds in a home. We didn't have that for actinobacteria. We didn't have that for uh, endotoxin. And then next NGS called next generation sequencing is a mega shift in technology to identify uh, microbes. And David Lark worked with helping Envirobiomics and Gianni Rossi really get set up with offering some of that. And then Dr. Shimik was finally able to start evaluating building envelopes for endotoxin and actinobacteria. The other thing with your percentages, those are mainly based with brain MRI with Neuroquan. So when we see brain atrophy on Neuroquan, when we see brain atrophy on Neuroquan, the majority are driven by endotoxin. So I will tell you, sewer gas is way more violent statistically than molds for shrinking your brain, right? But mold will crash that caudate 
mold swells the cortical gray and the forebrain parenchyma. So water damage serves water damage building molds swells the frontal cortex, your forebrain parenchyma, and swells the cortical gray. So for our listeners, if you cut a Twinkie in half, that yellow cake part of the Twinkie is the gray matter, and that will swell as a microedema with serves water damage building molds, which feels like a hangover. For uh, endotoxin, it shrinks, the cortical, the Twinkie shrinks, the cortical gray matter shrinks. So the majority of atrophy is seen with endotoxin, poop, sewer gas, manure, caca. Second is actinobacteria shoals, multi-nuclear atrophy, many different regions of your brain shrink. And then mold is, is the caudate shrinks. But then what about beta-glucans? So remember for our listeners, we're talking about the microbial stew. And one of the things when we were talking, you asked me about using the ERMI as a basic index for kind of water damage? And the answer is yes, but it's not enough. You still need to order an endotoxin and actinobacteria, but actinobacteria literally have enzymes that eat fungal and create beta-glucan fragments, right? So what I just said is if you have a fungus and actino in the same building, you're probably going to have beta-glucans. This is why one of the biggest things I want to make sure your listeners know, this is why if you have water damage, it needs to come out. Do not let anyone sell you on an ozone bomb or a fogger kit or a mold plate. Because remember, I can show you mold on a plate. I can fog it and then show you a, a, a one-hour gravity plate. And, and there won't be any microbes growing because you may have killed mold. But when you kill mold, for the listeners who aren't doing visual, I'm drawing a circle with my hands. If you do bleach or you do a antimicrobial fog or you do thyme oil or whatever the flavor of the flaky day is, you are going to rupture that cell wall fragment. Now draw that circle with dashed lines. Those cell wall fragments are hundreds of times more stimulating to your native, native immune cytokine. So TGF, beta, C4A, uh, MMP9 are going to flare much more, but they don't show up on a mold plate. Those cell wall fragments do get picked up by a QPCR, MSQPCR Swiffer cloth for Ermia hurts me. And they do get picked up on a Swiffer cloth for actinobacteria, aka actinomycetes and or endotoxin, right? So that's where the industry kind of maliciously or just um, through ignorance doesn't realize that they just took a house and made it more sick for our patients with a fog bomb or an ozone bomb or bleaching it. You know, the husband is often the most guilty with with bleaching it. <laughs> You know, so uh, just bleach it. Sometimes in Texas, they shoot at the mold, right? But none of that works. You got to rip water damaged materials out like a cancer. And just like you cut out a cancer with clean borders, industry standard is to go 12 to 24 inches outside of anything that got wet, whether it's dry rot or it's it's damp. So, so Dr. Shoemaker has been beating the drum the whole time. He just finally has technology to prove thoughts he had 20 years ago. But you know, Richie, and you know that he doesn't go public with something that's not proven. He's not a feelings guy. He's a fact guy. And people who get turned off by him because he can be gruff and tough, he is the most lovable, incredible, extraordinary mentor a guy could have because he challenges me on everything in the best interest of my sick patient's time, money, and energy. And they do not have unlimited time, money, and energy. So when someone comes in and they did 10 rounds of IV ozone to treat their SIRS, which is nonsense, I just wasted 10 rounds of IV ozone that I need to fix a crawl space, right? And then the cash bleeds out and the tension goes up and the marriage is divorced and the kid gets on Ritalin and 80 things happen because... Dr. Shoemaker is so mean with all of his agitated factual thoughts. So he's not going to go public with something if it's not proven. So finally, we have the technology to prove that it is the microbial stew, the water damaged microbial stew that can drive SIRS. And that sometimes people are getting driven by actinobacteria, but not mold. Sometimes people are getting driven by endotoxin, but not actinobacteria. And that's where Genie and Neuroquant are the only two tools that don't show specificity of SIRS, Dr. Shoemaker's confirmatory labs show SIRS, but show specificity of which biotoxins are driving SIRS. 
I want to talk a little bit now about the endotoxin contribution to SIRS. So my understanding is these are not endotoxins related to actinos, that those are actually gram positive, where endotoxins are coming from gram negative bacteria. So are endotoxins different from what we also call LPS or lipopolysaccharides? And what are the primary sources or bacteria that are leading to these endotoxin exposures that are driving SIRS? And then related to that, that, are the endotoxins ultimately then making their way into the body like the mycotoxins might be when we're talking about mold exposure? Yeah, that's a mouthful there, Scott. All right, let's tease it out. So gram positive, gram negative. Don't overthink this. If you're new to biochemistry, you put this purple stain on a, on a bug. If it absorbs the ultraviolet color, it's gram positive. If it doesn't absorb, it's gram negative, right? So it's just a way to separate out microbes. Gram positive bacteria are actinomycetes. Gram negative bacteria are endotoxin, which is synonymous with lipopolysaccharides. And what that means is the outer membrane of that bacteria breaks off, and that's the endotoxin. So what Scott's alluding to is E. coli, like if I get a GI bug, E. coli is a gram negative bug that releases E. coli toxin, which is a lipopolysaccharide or, or an endotoxin. This is why we will give, our clinic gives well caller cholestyramine if you have E. coli or Clostridium difficile, another gram negative lipopolysaccharide or C. diff toxin releasing because as soon as that lipopolysaccharide gets released, you literally rupture your, your gut lining, right? If you want to create leaky gut in a rat model, you just inject them with LPS from uh, endotoxin from E. coli, right? This is why Wim Hof is so flipping crazy because he injected himself with lipopolysaccharide from E. coli to prove that he could control inflammation through his breath method. And then he did it with... 24 um, students, 12 uh, healthy controls, 12 uh, uh, people that did healthy people that did the Wim Hof breathing and the Wim Hof breathers managed their IL-6 and their TNF. That's what we think of as I got E. coli or I took too many antibiotics and I got Clostridium difficile and now I have raging diarrhea. So if you ever take antibiotics for the providers out there, you need to co-prescribe not only probiotics, but also well-called cholestyramine to mop up the lipopolysaccharide from that gut buck. What Scott and I are talking about today is sewer gas, poop, manure, caca, doo-doo, baby diapers. What about memory care homes where, where, where adults are, are sitting around in their poopy diapers? These are all sources of endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide. And we are talking about the inhalation of those freshies. Right. We're talking about the inhalation of those lipopolysaccharides. So just to put this into context of where we've caught elevated endotoxin on a home, we had one neighbor who single mom with three kids had three dogs who had so many landmines in the neighbor's backyard. She couldn't have tea on her deck because it just smelled like one big pile of dog poop. That's what was contaminating the inside of her house. We've had people whose horse barns aren't well-maintained and too close to the home, and that will contaminate. The biggest contaminator is a simple P-trap, which looks like the, the tube that looks like a U underneath your sink or in a floor drain, particularly in dry climates next to heating elements. If that thing's next to an HVAC, those will dry out. And P-traps are simply profound and profoundly simple. When water is in there, that blocks sewer gas so you don't smell neighbor Johnny's poop coming into your home, right? We also have a lot of people who are on septic in Colorado, and we've had a lot of people with failed septic, or they have a piece of flagstone over their septic access instead of a manhole lid with, with rubber membrane that seals tight. So if you smell sulfury smells, if you smell manure, if you let your cat who pile up right? And you don't maintain your kitty litter box. Well, if old yeller is crap in the carpet, right? These are all sources of endotoxin for CIRS. And that is inhalation of gram negative lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin releasing organisms. So similar then to what we're going to talk more about with actinomycetes, it sounds like endotoxins are really distinctly different from 
water intrusion, water damage building. They could be coming from drain pipes and P-traps and things of that nature, but they're not necessarily correlated to the leak that we had in the roof that might have gotten some drywall wet, or is there a connection to water intruded buildings as well? Unless it's a poop pipe, then no. So we all poop in the toilets that flush into a sewer main and then go out to a septic system or a a city sewer, or you have a composting toilet. And that's why we have problems with composting toilets, right? How do you, how do you keep those clean? When we're camping and I'm going to composting toilet as a recovered service patient, I, (laughs) when I breathe, pardon my French, but I sit and shit and I get out of there. Right. And, and that's why when my kids, my teenagers go into the bathroom with their phones, they go, no phones on, on the body, right? Because what do they do? They poop. They sit in their own stink. It's like, sit, take a poop. If you're constipated, talk to your dad. He deals with constipation all day in, in the service population, right? So in, in regards to could it be from a leak, we have found pipes that are sources of sewer gas and poop, but they are plumbing pipes. Right. And what you do, if you really can't find the source of endotoxin is you get a plumber to do a smoke test. And what you do with a smoke test is you basically pump theater fog like you would on a theater stage for a Dracula play or maybe Motley Cruz come in your town. They got all that theater fog going. Right. And you look for leaks in your plumbing and you can find pinhole leaks. You open all your kitchen cabinets, you go to all your floor drains. For our affluent patients, some of these patients have 7,000 square foot compounds and no one has used the east wing bathroom in months or the guest room. If you're washing your hands, flossing your teeth, doing dishes, every time you're using that sink, you're going to refill that P-trap underneath. But if there's any kind of breach in the integrity of the pipe or the joint or you don't use it enough and the water in the P-trap is dried out, you're going to get theater gas coming out of there. And then you can go, ah, sometimes it's as simple as pouring a gallon of water down there once or twice a month. Other times you have a breach in your plumbing. Many people have discussed the potential contribution of mold and mycotoxins as triggers for mast cell activation syndrome. Do we know if exposure to actinos or endotoxins or beta-glucans may also trigger our mast cells and histamine? We don't know. Let's talk about, uh, I'll celebrate uh, Keith Bernstein's a friend of mine who's not actively practicing anymore. I think you've had him on. He's uh, amazing, yeah. He's amazing. What was then Mold Congress, now SIRSX, Phoenix 2015. If you go to SIRSX.com, we, I just curated all of the talks. So historically, we just had them by conference. And if you went to the conference, I have more of an audiographic memory. So I remember how Keith spoke in Phoenix 2015. But now we've organized them by topic, Genie, Actinomycetes, Endotoxin. This just got released the other day. I spent 24 hours curating it. Marsha Cash spent like 10 hours organizing it. So it looks kind of internet 1990s. We're going to keep sprucing it up, but we just wanted to get out there so people can learn more. Keith did a great talk. And then Lysander Jim, who's actively practicing, uh, a wonderful medical doctor, good buddy of mine. He also did some talks on histamine. And then we've asked Dr. Shoemaker about this. And what we're seeing is about 20 to 30% of SERS patients are histamine releasing people. Now, you know, Dr. Shoemaker hates the word MCAS and, and mast cell activation disorder because it's improper nomenclature. It's not just your mast cells that release histamine, right? There are other cells that release histamine, right? And on Genie, how Dr. Shoemaker figured out Genie is Genie doesn't just look at SNP chip technology, right? MTHFR means you have a gene. Does it tell you if it's activated or unactivated? No. HLA is very, very helpful for biotoxin because ten of Dr. Shoemaker's 10,000 biotoxin ill, 95% had genetic predisposition from HLA, 95%. To compare that, Caucasians with rheumatoid arthritis are 58%. Hashimoto's patients are 79% HLA predisposition, right? 95% genetic predisposition on chromosome 6 or inflammatory response genes for disease is massive. So if I have a mom or a dad who's sick and they're worried about four-year-old little Timmy and they don't have two bad genes, we can just do a, a lab corp cheek swab for HLA for 200 bucks. And I can tell you if the kid's genetically uh, susceptible to going into SIRS, but it doesn't tell us is SIRS turned on. 
you had to add MMP9, TGF beta, C4A, C3A for acute Lyme to see if, if you had chronic inflammatory response syndrome, if you were chronically spitting out inflammation. What Genie does is it in real time shows if these light switch genes are turned on, manufacturing inflammation to specific biotoxins. So for example, the CD14, the toll receptor 2, and the toll receptor 4 gene, they turn on from endotoxin, from sewer gas, from poop. The MAP kinases in conjunction with TGF beta receptor 1, receptor 2, or receptor 3 gene, those turn on with actinobacteria. There's, a, there's genes that turn on specifically for Lyme. There's genes that turn on specifically for Lyme six months post-antibiotic treatment. There's genes that specifically turn on for mold and mycotoxin. Defensins come up for bacteria. There's a gene FKBP5 that just turns on and manufactures inflammation from trauma. Wow. So that's changed my view on trauma. So what Dr. Shoemaker did in classic form is he took 70 plus healthy control people and pulled a genie on them. And then he pulled 100 genies on documented CIRS patients. Uh, naive to treatment, didn't get on cholestyramine well call yet, and looked at thousands of genes with Jimmy Ryan, who deserves just as much credit as Dr. Shoemaker for this. Those two are like Batman and Robin. It's amazing. What he did is he took the most statistically significant gene expression, upregulated or downregulated, turned on or turned off in the SERS patients relative to healthy controls, and that is the genie. And the reason, that, and, and Genie stands for genetic expression, inflammation explained. It's the first time we don't just look at a SNP chip. 23andMe, Ancestry.com, they just tell you if you have a gene. They don't tell you if the gene is turned on manufacturing inflammation or turned off not manufacturing energy, ATP synthase. When that gene is blue on a genie, it means you're not making energy, right? You're not making chi, prana, life force. So the reason I explain all that, Scott, is on there is two of the histamine genes, so when those genes turn on, you're producing histamine. And per Dr. Shoemaker and Dr. Jim, Lysander, and, and Keith, Dr. Bernstein's talk, we are seeing in our over 100 genies at this point, probably two, 300 genies at this point, we're seeing about 20 to 30% have the histamine genes turned on. So I'm going to come back in just a minute to HLA and Genie, but I want to talk a little bit first about the environmental testing. So how often do you find someone's external environment tests relatively clean, relatively well from a mold, from a mycotoxin perspective, and yet they still have SIRS, which is being triggered by actinos or by endotoxins? Maybe put differently, do you find testing for the actinos in the environment is now critical? Do you think we should be maybe leading with those tests? tests and kind of using the ERMI as an adjunct way of exploring the environment. What are your thoughts on the importance of testing actinos and endotoxins relative to ERMI and Hurts Me Too based on what we know today? Yeah, maybe it's the name Scott, like Dr. McMahon, my homie, but you might be my brother for another mother because I asked David Lark to specifically speak on this for SIRS X because we all have the same question. Can you use the ERMI Hurts Me as some kind of litmus test? for could there be other bacteria? And we have single moms with three kids driving up homeless in a station wagon and every dollar matters, right? The answer, the short answer is no. Every single patient we have documented with SIRS, we now do a ERMI or hurts me, right? Remember, hurts me is the five most immunoreactive molds for Dr. Shoemaker's work and is about $150 cheaper than, than an ERMI. If you're maybe entering a lawsuit or needing to break a lease, it's always ERMI because having more data on a building is better than less data. We don't do lawsuits, but Dr. Lysander Jim does, Dr. McMahon does, and they want the ERMI to, to, to show uh, things like Aspergillus niger and Arabicidium pululans and all these other molds to, to potentially show that. But we have normal ERMI hurts me's more often than I'd like with problematic actinos and or problematic endotoxin. And this goes into the, on SIRSX.com, I, I put $22,000 of my own money in 2022 into polishing the actino research. And that's because for those of you who don't know, Dr. Shoemaker put millions of his own dollars. Instead of having a yacht or a second house in Vail, he spent it on figuring out biotoxin illness pathway. So me and my family could be healthy and all the patients we all can be healthy. So anyone who like 
flexes or talks doo-doo about that man has a problem with me because he is the most honest, generous scientist who dedicated his life to figuring out this mystery illness, which is an epidemic in our country. Right. So he put in all that money. So I was like, I'm, I'm like, I can throw down for 22 K and in, in donated uh, Actino Swiffers and donated Actino skin swabs. And what we found is if someone moves into new construction and they didn't screw up the plumbing and the P traps haven't dried out. Right. You'll see these beautiful endotoxin numbers and you'll see this beautiful hurts me, but the Actinos can be high. And what happens is, Water damage building bacteria, pathogenic actinomycetes need an AW, need a certain level of moisture to grow. So these pathogenic actinobacteria, particularly Carinobacterium tubercularostericum, which we nicknamed CT, and Propionobacterium acnes, which we nicknamed PA, which is also Cutibacterium acnes, Propiobacterium acnes, Cutibacterium. I know you know this, Scott, but for the listeners, those are totally synonymous, right? Those are the pathogenic actinomycetes. And what makes them different is they have mycolic acid in their cell wall. And mycolic acid is a super waxy fat. And in chemistry, you call saponification, adding soap to a fat to see how much soap you need to break down that fat is saponification. And mycolic acid is like candle wax. And it is in the cell membrane of Carinobacterium tubercularostericum propionobacterium acnes. And what we discovered is you can have them get their start in a water damaged building, but then they can colonize somebody just like Marcons can colonize you. And then you can vector them with you wherever you go. And with some of the work we did with Larry Schwartz on this, when we were throwing down that money, the bedrooms were the highest for P. acnes and, and, and CT. And that's when we started saying, well, where does someone lay and shed and spread? The living rooms were high. In my SIRS X talk on actinomycetes, the problem is you, right? The, the point I was making is, hey, you are now the vector. And the Dorninger family had high actino levels. We were on a, a duplex, 2,400 square foot boulder house, 1,200 over 1,200. And we did about 90% of our living and everyone's bedroom was on the second floor. We were high on that floor. We were very low downstairs where we'd occasionally watch the Super Bowl or, or some Nuggets game, stuff like that, right? So you can buy a new construction and the construction workers could have shed and spread P. acnes and Carinobacterium tuberculosterium. The good news is you can double HEPA vacuum and then either use a soap water solution or Fantastic, a, a, a quat for our chemically sensitive people. We do more of the soap water for, for the people who don't mind a little Fantastic. That's an excellent way to knock that down. And you can vacuum everything twice, damp, damp wipe with a disposable Swiffer cloth over and over and over again. You go over it. It's full of dirt. You rip it off, put it on. You go over the same area. It's it's now light tan. You rip that off. You go over it again. The, the, the soapy Swiffer or the Fantastic is snow white. Now you're done with that area and you can reset a home. Dr. Shoemaker was using the uh, coal tar shampoo, Medicalsp. And that's a gas and oil, a petroleum derivative product. It works super good on scalp psoriasis over my last 20 years in, in private practice. But my granola organic boulder folks don't go for petroleum stuff. I rolled jujitsu and defense soap was working for ringworm and stubborn staph infections in the, in the jujitsu and wrestling community. And that's no joke when you get a bad staff as a wrestler. And we decided to look into tea tree and eucalyptus oil, which defense soap has, which do knock back Carinobacterium uh, tuberculosterium and P. acne. So that's a very long winded source to tell you what we figured out with Dr. Shoemaker is then we have NGS sequencing now. So we can detect actinobacteria. And I got sick again from COVID while being an actino. And I'll talk about that a little later. But we pulled my blood for actino vesicles. And sure enough, topical actinos is penetrating into the bloodstream and triggering SIRS, uh, secondary to actinobacteria, folks. So, so one thing to clarify, I had done a podcast with Larry previously on actinomycetes as well. And my understanding was that it was 
commonly drain pipe related as well, not necessarily related to water damaged or water intrusion. But are you suggesting that there are certain water intrusions that also then add to the Actinos burden or are those also yeah. unrelated? Yeah, that's a great clarification. The answer is C, all the above. You need water to amplify pathogenic Actinos. So could that come from water sitting in a pipe? Could it come from an actual leak? As soon as that water level goes up, those pathic, pathogenic actinos have an opportunity to amplify and, and, and stoke disease. And the piece that I think is important about this conversation is it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have had a leak or a water intrusion. You can have high levels of actinos and you're living in an environment that never had a water intrusion from a roof leak or a pipe break or something along those lines. So it, 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 that, that was the thing that came out of the conversation that I had with Larry as well. Wow, now we're talking about SIRS and you may not even be in a building that had actual water damage. Yes. In regards to what we talked about before, the audio is a little lousy on this one because Dr. Shoemaker had to pipe in via Zoom. But Fort Lauderdale, Sir X, he talks about Actinos driving Parkinsonism and treating the Actinos. We help neutralize Parkinsonism. I'm working with my classmate, Lori, Lori Mishley, MD, uh, ND, Nancy David, PhD, MPH, a little bit of an overtriever, who I call the queen of Parkinson's. And I'm trying to get her work to unite with Dr. Shoemaker's work so we could potentially find a true underlying cause for Parkinson's. Because Parkinson's isn't a diagnosis. It's, it's what you have. It's a constellation of symptoms. It's not why you have, right? So in, in regards to that, what we're noticing for what you just said, Scott, is you could have a really aging, fair skin. This is this is the archetype we don't know yet. We have we need more African American data sets. We need more Asian American data sets. We just have right now too many. Uh, we need more Caucasians, but we need everyone represented. But these Caucasian males with Parkinsonism, with, with with fair skin, we're tending to have very flaky skin. And all I can tell you anecdotally. For the internet, anecdotally, is to this day, we've seen these P acnes on the skin swabs. You want them less than 10,000 on the skin swabs. We've seen them 1.8 million, 2.8 million. And one of the highest was a husband of a SERS patient who, when he gets out of bed in the morning, it looks like his body left behind a, a shed snakeskin. It's like skin chips are left behind. And he's one of the highest actinos. Now, we didn't get to pull blood on him yet. SIRS needs to be on his differential diagnosis, but we're treating her and all the time and money and energy are going into her first because she's been really sick. But she, he was her uh, exposure. And in that, just like mold, you can live in actinobacteria and not be sick, right? And this is what we showed with Dr. Shoemaker and the COVID paper. What I'm telling you is COVID long haulers are a SIRS, and what we saw is they were living in endotoxin. They were living in actinobacteria, not mold. They got COVID. They didn't die of the COVID, but they turned on the endotoxin inflammatory genes, CD14, uh, toll receptor 2, toll receptor 4, or the actinomab kinases, TGF beta receptors, or both, and are now chronic inflammatory uh, response syndrome patients. You know what works for COVID long hauling? Shoemaker protocol. But you know what's weird? When you have to tell a patient, hey, you were fine in your house with actinobacteria and a little bit of sewer gas, but now we have to do a total overhaul of your house and take uh, biotoxin binding medicine, cholestyramine, walcol, cholestyramine, cholestopol, questran, take those biotoxins to the toilet, maybe you set up Marcons and then reboot your body with vasoactive intestinal peptide all because you got this virus. So again, we, we proved in that paper, COVID is a priming event for SIRS, but remember genetics loads the gun and then you're in your environment of Actino or, or you get a Lyme tick or a recluse spider bite or, or you're living, you move near a, a algae bloom shed or whatever, and you're still relatively fine. And then you got a cold or a flu or the Lyme tick is, is, is infectious in its own right. And you wake up chronic inflammatory responses genes that manufacture widgets of inflammation were turned off and now they're turned on even though you didn't die of the COVID. 
So talking about genes, the HLA-DR part that we talked about, that's been what we've been focused on. That that really was the kind of primary tool for potential predisposition to SIRS for many years. I think I heard Dr. Shoemaker even say that uh, it, it's not maybe held up as well as what we now have with Genie, where we can look at the gene expression rather than just looking at the, the potential genetics with HLA-DR. So I'm interested in is there a connection between HLA-DR types that we know of, the Rosetta Stone, and those that are then predisposed to actinos or to endotoxins or to beta-glucans? And then kind of building on that, what are some of the things that the genie has taught you about your patients? What are the patterns that you observed from working with genie that maybe we didn't understand before we had that technology? Yeah, because I believe in civil discourse, and I know you're a critical thinker. I totally politely disagree with the way you talked about HLA. I still freaking love it. And and one of the things my wife was so good about when we were sick as a family is making sure my kids didn't think we were sick, right? So there's this weird thing as a, as a human being, as a parent, where you got to like pretend you're not sick while you're totally doing everything for differential diagnosis and getting a treatment plan that will heal you. Right. You don't want to wallow in victimization. And, you know, we always tell our patients empowered, not panicked. And I'll get moms and dads who will be like, do my kids have SIRS? Do we need to do the full workup? And I'm like, slow your roll. Let's spend your time, money, energy on mom or dad right now or sister or whoever. But let's get a cheek swab on your kid because they may have inherited your non-biotoxin illness gene and be less susceptible. And here's how we roll with families in HLA. If you know that child has a biotoxin HLA and they were happy-go-lucky and crushing academics and socializing in band or in sports or whatever, and all of a sudden, they're all depressed, they're isolating, their brain doesn't work, they're getting headaches, and you're like, oh, college is stressful. Maybe. I knew that kid. They were looking forward to flying the coop. Maybe they moved into a moldy dorm or a moldy fraternity house. And so on and so forth. So I like having the HLA just kind of keep an eye on, hey, if your your child or your later adult child ever says, mom, like something's wrong with me. Like, I want to put a Glock in my mouth. I am just not thinking right. Right. That was me. I had brain fog, hardcore fatigue, hardcore depression and weird suicidal flotations that did not have anything to do with how I feel. Like, I love life. I mean, I, I one day I'll be ready to leave this earth, but I'm not ready, right? And to have someone say, hey, go look at that balcony. You know, let's see if you can jump. That is nothing to do with me. That is neuroinflammation, right? And if we don't educate society on that, more people are going to accidentally take their lives, right? So that's what I like about HLA is it kind of just says, okay, yeah, predisposed by this, just so you know, hon, like if you're ever feeling what I feel, we're going to be all over it. You won't have to wait 23 years to get to a Shoemaker certified clinic to do a proper differential diagnosis. No BS urinary mycotoxin test or all this other nonsense. Do a visual contrast sensitivity, has 37 symptoms, uh, range into 13 groups or clusters, and do a biotoxin exposure screening, 98.5% uh, sensitivity if you're a positive ECS and clustered symptoms, 98% sensitivity if you're just 8 out of 10 clustered symptoms, 8 out of 13 clustered symptoms, 6 out of 13 for kids. We do the confirmatory labs, and we got you in treatment, right? You don't have to wall around in 20 years of disability and suicidal thought and depression and angst and broken marriages and dead libidos, and I can't do CrossFit anymore. Right. So we love the HLA. But what HLA is, is on chromosome six, you have all of your inflammatory response genes. So I think it's cool that Ben Lynch like promoted MTHFR and stuff like that. But that's so downstream for inflammatory illnesses, chronic illness patients, all the actions on chromosome six. That's where psoriatic arthritis, HLA B27 gene, that's where the HLA DQ2 and 8 celiac gene is, that's where your Hashimoto's gene is, your type 1 diabetes gene, your rheumatoid arthritis gene, your biotoxin illness gene. It's all on chromosome 6 because all of them are chronically ill. 99% of them are based in inflammation. So go to the gene chromosome 6 that has inflammation. But it's still SNP chip technology, which is just you have a gene or you don't. Where Gene changed everything is in real time we can see if specific genes are turned on, transcribing, manufacturing, producing widgets, or turned off. 
on a genie, I'm going to do a, a little YouTube on, on going over my own genie for this. If your bubbles, which says the gene name in there is pink or red, that means it's upregulated or turned on. So think of all these genes as light switches and it's pink, red, it's turned on. There are certain genes you want turned on. How about a gene like ATP synthase? That synthesizes ATP. You want that bright lights on Broadway, flaming red, just pumping out ATP. There are other genes that manufacture cytokines that we want blue and turned off, right? So light blue, blue is the genes turned off. What you're going to see a lot on Genie is the inflammation genes are red and the energy producing genes are blue. And that's, as you know, Scott, called molecular hypometabolism, which is the fancy term for chronic fatigue syndrome secondary to CIRS, right? And, and so what's so cool about Genie is where... A failed VCS, HLA, MMP9, C4A, TGF-beta, low MSH, ACTH cortisol mismatch, osmolality, ADH mismatch, gliadin antibodies, and VEGF. If you have five out of 10 of those off or more, you've confirmed SIRS. You don't know specificity of biotoxin exposure. What the genie shows is in real time, it can say, okay, you got SIRS. Is that because you're in endotoxin? Is that because you're in actinobacteria? Is it because you're in mold? And then you can even be in mold, but not reacting to it. So I just had a patient the other day who has a hurts me of 14, but we had a genie on her and her mycotoxin triggering inflammatory genes are not turned on. Should we not deal with the mold in that building? Absolutely not. We got to deal with it because she could catch a cold as a priming event. And now she's also turned on those genes. But when she was going to stay in a safe house while they did the three months of work on her home, we had a hurts me of 12. And she said, is this okay? It's great. She's a medical doctor. It's a great question because she's immune reacted to actinobacteria. And the actinomycetes testing was beautiful on this rental. And it had a hurts me of 12. We couldn't find anything better. And I said, yes, but just don't catch a major cold or a super bad COVID while you're here. Because in theory, you could turn on. SIRS water damage building molds too. So, so the genie is a real time snapshot of what is triggering the inflammation, including that FKBP5 gene. I want to say one more thing just to wrap this up on this, and that is the trauma gene. And I love DNRS and Gupta and um, Joe Dispenza's work. I love that Joe's doing stuff with UCSD and, and trying to really prove the power of meditation on, on biomarkers and stuff like that. And our patients, we have seven of them who had the trauma gene, FKBP5, turned on from trauma, manufacturing inflammation. When they did either of those, DNRS, Gupta, or, or Dispenza's work, in earnest, they really did the work, and we redid their genies, that gene turned off and stopped manufacturing inflammation. Where wow. I get freaked, wow, I was right. Where I get freaked out is where the DNRS coach, I know Annie Hopper doesn't say this, says, DNRS can treat your SIRS. Annie would never say that. I, I've had Annie this conversation, as you that. know, know I've had this conversation with her many times because she's always been very clear that you need to also build on a platform of environmental awareness, as you well know. So I think that's just a unfortunate misunderstanding about what her it position is really is. Downstream pollution of her work. And that is a real bummer. Be and, and, and it goes vice versa. The Shoemaker Protocol, doesn't treat the FKBP5 inflammatory gene. The Shoemaker protocol treats the endotoxin genes. It treats the actinobacteria, it treats the Lyme genes. The biggest mistake in Lyme treatment is people forget the well-called cholestyramine. Remember, the, you need the antibiotics to wipe out the Lyme, but Dante et al. in 1998 published the BB toxin 1, which needs to get mopped up. Otherwise, you're going to keep triggering MMP9 and C4 and C3 and so on and so forth. If we get honest and say, holy sugar, your meditation, your parasympathetic methods turned off a gene that manufactures inflammation from trauma. That is plenty, right? If the Shoemaker protocol turns off CIRS inflammatory genes, that is plenty, right? But what's cool about Genie is once in a blue moon, you'll see someone who's out of CIRS, but their trauma genes on.
I think Jill Carnahan will be very interested in what you just had to say as well, because she's talked a lot recently about how her SERS patients really do need to do, in many cases, limbic system type work. And it sounds like now you're able to prove that from the genie. Uh, certain patients do. And what I don't like is when we project that onto everybody, because there are some people who just like have start done four startup companies are so functional. They, they get whacked with SERS and they just come in and they're like, dude, I trust you. My friend told me about you. Just tell me what I got to do. And they just go like this. They don't need to meditate. They need to get back to CrossFit and starting another company and creating jobs, right? Then there's other people who have had so much trauma in their life that if they don't get back into parasympathetic, they can't sit still to even listen to how to take cholestyramine. And what's interesting about them is if they have two genes, two biotox back to HLA, I said, guess where these genes came from? Your biological mom, biological dad. Is it time to open the door of forgiveness? Because they may have been untreated SERS patients with agitated brains, impatience, uh, bipolar tendencies, you know, drug addiction, alcoholism, trying to treat their neuroinflammation and no one was available. They might have had SERS before Dr. Shoemaker discovered the biotoxin pathway. So just then to clarify, if we look at the Rosetta Stone today for HLADR, we don't see actinos, endos, beta-glucans. We don't see any of those things. So would that be the multi-susceptibles that are then susceptible to all of those things? Or can the mold and or Lyme susceptibles still have these susceptibilities that we're talking about that we're just starting to understand in more depth? We don't know. I'm going to plug something that's pretty cool that we're trying to do. So we finally got our 501c established. It's the Roots and Branches Charitable Fund. And this was started by like an upper middle class patient of mine and ours. And he had irretractable headaches, red days, where his headaches would not go away. He had all the money in the world, been everywhere, no one could help him with his headaches. He, had, he is a controlled type one diabetic who had untreated sleep apnea and CIRS, endotoxin, actinos, and mold. And he is headache free. He was grateful to our staff just as much as he was to the provider team, because our staff is extraordinary. They're human beings who pick up the phone, help search patients organize their life. And he wanted to bonus them uh, with, with a Christmas bonus to say thank you, the staff, the essential workers. And I said, yes, please, because we pay them well, but it's brutal to live on the front range with uh, administrative staff pay, right? And I said, but what I really want is I want money for indigent care. I want money for research. And I want money to start a building project of sirewall safe houses where someone could come in, live in a safe house for three months. We rock the protocol while they get their building straightened out or a husband gets shown that he can have his wife back, whatever the flavor of the day is. And we finally started the Roots and Branches Charitable Fund. Our goal is to get a $2 million. We're like 15K so that we can just take a $100,000 endowment. And when I get these, don't call my office if you are not like in a station wagon homeless, right? You have to prioritize your money to deal with your SERS. But at some point, we want to have a big time Harvard level endowment where we can take care of those who just are in such a socioeconomic spot. But the other thing we want to spend money on is research. And as soon as we get a little money on there, we're going to go to see you. We're going to get a pre-med student and we're going to have them cross-reference our genies with immune reactivity to endotoxin, actinobacteria, mold, Lyme, et cetera, with the HLA and see if we can help grow the Rosetta Stone. Because again, when Dr. Shoemaker figured that out, he didn't have genie, he didn't have neuroquan, and he didn't have the NGS and Swiffer cloths to evaluate a building for endotoxin, not actinobacteria. And, and with HLADR, I, I think it is a useful tool for potential predisposition to biotoxin illness. But I'm curious, do you find that the HLADR becomes a predictor of treatment outcome? Or do you feel that when the protocol is implemented appropriately, people with even maybe the more challenging HLADR types can recover equally well? Yeah, so we're well over a thousand biotoxin patients in. Over 500 have completely graduated. And the Shoemaker protocol has never failed, regardless of HLA. For the people who are still sick, they are stuck on step one. They are still in exposure. So when people say Shoemaker protocol didn't work, 
I need their clearance tests. I need everything. And what I see is sloppiness. We don't use urinary mycotoxins for screening. We don't use glutathione to detox biotoxins. We use quaternary ammonium. We do organic chemistry. We don't do alchemy, right? So if you can't show me that you've normalized the C4A, TGF, beta, and MMP9 off of, you know, charcoal or whatever, because that's what Dr. Shoemaker did. It's not like I have a problem with any other provider. I'm of the old school academics where we challenge each other in the name of the patient's time, money, and energy. If you don't have hard, honest data, then you have to present it as an experiment. And what Dr. Shoemaker did is he tried activated charcoal. It didn't normalize those markers. He tried Ben Nightclay. It didn't normalize those markers. He tried Kytosan. Kytosan has the same organic chemistry of cholestyramine. The problem is stomach acid breaks it down. So by the time it gets over to your common bile duct to pick up the biotox, it's no longer viable, right? So, so the, the reason I share that is because we, we have to make sure people know if they've bait and switched or cherry picked the shoemaker protocol. If they haven't dove deep into their buildings, they're not going to get better if they are truly SIRS. And there is a strict screening criteria, BCS cluster symptoms, have you had biotoxic exposure? You ask a zillion list of, of environmental questions, hobby ponds and all kinds of stuff. And then there is validated confirmatory labs, right? And then after that, we now have the Neuroquan and the Genie that can give specific biotoxin causation. And real quick, last thing on that is the this breaks my heart because when people spend money on 10 IV glutathione or a whole bunch of something, et cetera, there's no money left to fix the buildings. And that I cannot, like I'm a blue collar kid with white collar opportunities who was raised right, cannot tell a lie. You need to freaking deal with the buildings. And when I take a complicated case to the godfather and I say, Dr. Shoemaker, I need help with this. The first thing he asks me is, where's the clearance test? And he doesn't just want to hurt me anymore. He wants hurts me or me, actinobacteria, and endotoxin. Right now we're in the middle with Larry Schwartz and Andy Hamian and are doing some work on beta glucans. We'll figure more on that. You had that lovely guest in on plasmologins and, and Dr. Shoemakers looking at that potential, but we have a protocol that doesn't fail. Now, if the science stopped right now, you could heal every SERS patient with the Shoemaker protocol. I want to wrap up the genie conversation just on a couple of uh, points. The genie, as I understand, has elucidated a lot of things. It's led to better understanding of SIRS as a condition. One of the things, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm I'm learning from this conversation as well. One of the things that I understand is that the genie showed us that hypercoagulation is a component of SIRS in some or many of the patients. Another thing that I believe I've heard Dr. Shoemaker talk about is that maybe from the genie work that we now maybe think that Marcons is a little lower on the list of things that are driving or triggering SIRS or keeping that kind of perpetual inflammatory cycle going. Wondering if you can either confirm or correct me on those two points. Yeah, let's start with the Marcons because for your listeners is a key point. You can't clear Marcons if you're not out of exposure. If you do, it'll be back. And the reason is exposure drives inflammation, which suppresses melanocyte stimulating hormone. And melanocyte stimulating hormone participates in mucosal immunity, your border patrol. So when you have, every time you take an antibiotic like uh, uh, moxicillin for strep, it's not just the antibiotic, but it's the antibiotic with your immune system that conquer the strep. So if you just snort BEG spray or EDTA or EDTA silver or NSB Formula One, Dr. DeShore's formula or ACS extra strength silver, and you don't deal with the building, you're going to really struggle getting rid of Marcon. So that's why it's step three and step one is remove patients from biotoxic exposure. The other thing is when you spray that, you rupture the Marcons and now you have cell wall fragments and you can have a flare in C4A and TGF beta one. That's why it's so important to be on high dose fish oil and adequate well-called cholestyramine. Do we pad and complement the Shoemaker protocol all the time? If you didn't poop, Biotoxin didn't get to the toilet. So if you're constipating or you have some gut issues, we're using all the naturopathic medicine, the funk med, the integrated med to, to get your gut going. But we don't bait and switch quaternary ammonium well-called cholestyrin with charcoal. 
right? So when you are dealing with Marcons, you have to be out of the building. So what you're alluding to is on the genie, you upregulate inflammation with Marcons, but taking straight EDTA spray, uh, two sprays each nostril three times a day, Dr. Shoemaker showed that you suppress or turn off the inflammation that Marcons is causing, even if the bug is still present. I know that's, that's kind of complicated, but that's six months of EDTA spray. He does with that. What Genevieve and Leanna and, and, and Dr. Birke and, and Emily and me do, my team, is we still say, if we're not able to kill Marcons, it's we're still having building issues, right? And we're gonna and we're gonna see that, right? So I don't know many clinics who grind as hard with the patients on their buildings as our clinic. And it's a pain in the keister. It's no fun. It's so easy to give supplements. I'm talking to my remediator in this ear complaining about Mrs. Smith and how she's crazy. And Mrs. Smith is literally calling in on the same call, telling me that this remediator is a piece of doo-doo, right? <laughs> and this is what I do with my life. But if you don't get the buildings right, if you don't have relationships with your inspectors, your remediators, and, and talking about the pros and cons of getting through remediation, you're not going to clear mark on well. But that's how that shows on the genie. Hypercoagulation. Thank you for saying that because there's another exciting one that leads to so on the genie, we have coagulation genes. And I almost think of this like the histamine genes. There is a subset of SIRS patients that turn on clotting genes with SIRS. And again, why did those genes make it on the genie? Because they were statistically higher than healthy controls when Dr. Shoemaker narrowed down the genes that should be on genie. So if you see hypercoagulation genes on a genie, those are micro, micro, micro clotting people. So we all talked about transient ischemic attacks or TIAs. And that's where you're talking to your aunt. She's like, hello. And then she comes back online. And you're like, oh, shoot, what just happened, right? That might be an ambulance ride, right? It's even more, more micro, micro than that. And you're just getting these little clotty decreases of healthy blood flow to the brain. And you can have atrophy from these micro clots. Now, the other thing that Genie shows is the tubulin A4A shows neurodegenerative diseases. And we might have exciting stuff coming out with Parkinson's ALS and Genie. I'm not going to say any more because that's Dr. Shoemaker's to strut about. And again, <laughs> the Godfather doesn't stop creating medical discoveries that are Nobel laureate deserving. Guys, well into 20 Nobel laureate prize in medicine discoveries, but but really his his most powerful swan song might be how SIRS and Genie and this model can help elude underlying causes of ALS and wow. Parkinson's. Yeah. Amazing. It would, it, it's amazing. It's amazing. Let's touch briefly on the envi envirobiomics actinose testing. What do you look for in a patient's environmental test to see whether or not you think that's going to still be a contributor to their condition? What do you look at from a dominance index, prevalence index perspective? Do you think that these indices that we're getting around actinose testing are maybe better representations of the potential health of the environment than the ERMI score, for example? What are you looking for when you're testing for actinose in the environment? Yeah, so I I wish I could have like a weekly update of being in an inner circle with Dr. Schumacher because you're moving at the speed of light. Like I could die tomorrow and say, man, I fell ass backwards into the most extraordinary professional mentorships uh, a guy could ever dream of. And I have Dr. Bill Blanchette for preventing heart attack and stroke. And I have Dr. Shoemaker, you know, Datis Karazi and helped me with a lot of stuff on neuroendocrine immune model, Bastier, Tori Hudson for women's health and Alan Gaby and Joe Pizzurno. And, and, and the, the list is endless. Patrick Donovan, an ER nurse come Indy, Dirk Powell, one of the last Bastier students for endocrinology. But Dr. Shoemaker is like every week, there's a, a, another level of learning. And since Genie, he's learning quicker because we can see in real time transcriptomics. But when we were figuring this out, the two things I can tell you, we'll start with endotoxin because it's easier. It says endotoxin less than 200. And what Dr. Shoemaker is doing is he's taking endotoxin Swiffer cloths, neuroquants. And remember the personality of endotoxin exposure on a neuroquant is cortical atrophy and at least 
to other uh, nuclear atrophy. That's the calling card of endotoxin neuroquine. And then on Genie, it's CD14, toll receptor 2 or toll receptor 4. When those turn red, that means you're, you're seeing the transcription of production of inflammation from being in poops or gas manure due to caca, right? But for endotoxin, it was under 200 on healthy levels for a house. The more data he got, the more genies and the more neuroquants and the more cortical atrophy, we can now say that endotoxin should be less than 100. In particular, if you have neuro issues, if you got headaches, if you got depression, if you got anxiety, if you got ADD, if you got Parkinson's, if you got memory issues, if you got AL, you got to get that endotoxin down, right? So don't look at it as 200, look at it as should be less than 100. For now over to Actino, the calling card for Actino on Neuroquan is multinuclear atrophy. It's not the cortical gray, it's just seeing three, four, five nuclear atrophy. And a lot of times, age inappropriate, right? When when we're comparing, when when we get brain MRI with Neuroquan from Health Images, our local imaging center, then we send it into surviving mold for the Neuroquan analysis. And that runs through Dr. Shoemaker's proprietary numbers on is your brain swollen or shrunken relative to healthy control brains in your age and gender, right? That, that's what that is. And sometimes we'll see like five nuclear atrophy in a 28-year-old. That is not normal right? In a 90-year-old, yeah, okay. So we finally have a big enough data set of healthy controls to do age categorization, right? And that's super important. So you'll see like four or five, three without the cortical atrophy as the actino calling card. Then you go to your Swiffer cloth and the human habitat is the actinobacteria that have the two pathogenic Actinomycetes or Actinobacterium, Carinobacterium tuberculosis stericum, and Propionobacterium acutibacterium acnes. What again makes them different? They have this mycolic cell wall that can penetrate into us and trigger our innate immune responses. So we're looking for those raw data numbers to be less than 10,000 on that Swiffer cloth. Now I might come back in a year and say, we've refined that even better because we have bigger data sets. So that is the prevalence index. The dominance index is the soil actinus. When Dr. Shoemaker first did this indices, we didn't know if soil actinos are pathogenic or not, right? And as of now, they are not pathogenic. So when you go running after a spring rain and you smell that lovely spring smell, some of that is actinophorts. Some of that is the actino in the soil got some water, are amplifying and growing, and they're letting off some microbial VOCs. And you go, ah, spring, and that is not pathogenic. And thank God, it's because if people are doing extreme avoidance and camping and stuff like that, they should be able to, to get away with camping as long as they're not camping next to an old mining shack or something that's full of stacky or ketomium. The calling card on Genie for actinobacteria is um, MAP kinases up and TGF beta receptors are up, one, two, or three. When you take cholestyramine or well call, so if you pull a genie and you're already on well call cholestyramine, you will normalize your TGF beta receptor. So you'll already see that improvement. So you can kind of get a little faked out. It's like kind of actino looking on genie versus a naive treatment uh, patient, which means they haven't taken cholestyramine or well call yet. And that's why there's stages. When you send in your genie, stage one is treatment naive, stage two is clean building and on well call cholestyramine, which is hard for us because some people are on well call cholestyramine, but their building's not totally done yet. So I call it like a stage 1.5. And then stage three is around VIP, stage four is off VIP, and stage five is relapse. So on when you hand in your genie paperwork. So back to that prevalence index and dominance index. So it says prevalence index should be less than 2.0. But if I have a prevalence index of 19.2, that's just showing me that the human habitat is much higher than the soil habitat in that building. But when I go to the Carinobacterium tuberculostericum, it might be a raw score of 6,200. That's very reasonable. Might be a Propionobacterium acnes of 2,300. That's very reasonable, right? We had a Carinobacterium last night on the Swiffer that was 446,000, right? On average, you're going to see the P. acnes is more dominant than the Carinobacterium tuberculostericum. But both of those ideally should be less than 10,000 on your Swiffer, less than 10,000 on your skin swabs. So let's 
talk a little more about the skin swabs. That was relatively new information to me that we can now do this envirobiomics qPCR bacteria analysis for actinos on the skin. So does everyone have these? Are they more concentrated on certain parts of the body? And can they be commensal in some people, but problematic or pathogenic in others? Well, let's start with the last question, because that's Commensal is basically just a bacteria that's taking up real estate, right? It's just taking up space. And I don't know how to answer that because if they got mycolic acid, they have, the way I would say it is, they're a potential pathogen because you could be fine because they're not triggering innate immune responses yet. And that's what we showed in the COVID study. People are sitting there in Actino, right? And they're fine. Then they get COVID, they don't die of the COVID, and now MAP kinases and TGF beta receptors are upregulated, producing inflammation, driving CIRS, right? So the answer is yeah. And that's the same reason a husband and a wife can be living in the same moldy building and she's like drooling with memory loss, no libido, exercise intolerance, skin rashes, et cetera, et cetera. And he's like, my grandpappy built this hunting cabin in 1890. It's fine. I feel great. And we're like, cool. Right. And now again, air quality is good, is important for everybody, but it is the it is the immune reactivity more than the toxicity for, for SIRS. And that's why it's called chronic inflammatory response syndrome, not chronic toxicity syndrome. Now, again, are there direct effects of toxins on nerves, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. So we think you can be colonized with pathogenic, potentially pathogenic actinobacteria and be fine. But if you're now turned on those, you have to get rid of the source. You have to take enough cholestyramine well call. Unfortunately, cholestyramine well call are working to turn off those genes on Genie. So if you're endotoxin, you get out of the endotoxin and the and those genes are still turned on, you take cholestyramine. But what I will tell you is it takes longer anecdotally through clinical observation to turn off the endotoxin genes than it does the mold genes. So it's like three to six months of cholestyramine well call, where in the SAIIE trials, the sequential activation of innate immune elements trials, it was six to 12 weeks of well call cholestyramine for mold exposure patients to, to reset. I want to get into a little bit of the environmental hygiene topic. What do you recommend for your patients? So is there any specific maintenance of drain pipes, for example, to minimize actino exposure. I know some people are using hydrogen peroxide. I think Larry Schwartz talks about that. I know others are using enzyme-based solutions. What do you suggest to your patients just for maintaining their drain pipes, their plumbing pipes to minimize actino exposure? Yeah, I just think it's, I would go broader on microbial growth needs organic matter, right? Wood pulp, paper. It's the three little pig story. Americans are slobs. We build with paper and pulp and OSB, right? Old school Europe is steel and tile and stone. Spores, bacteria are everywhere. You still don't have a problem in amplification until you have water. So it's about protecting your home from moisture, right? It's about making sure your gutters run five feet away from the house. It's making sure you clean your gutters and making sure you deal with that roof after a hailstorm or a roof that needs to be replaced. But in regards to sinks, a lot of times people have garbage disposals and they'll just put a lot of organic matter. Much better to get a compostable bag, throw your compost in there, tie it off and, and, and put it in a compost bin if you can. And then I do think hydrogen peroxide is a good maintenance of a sink as is, is enzyme products. But, but really all you're doing is trying to keep things low on organic matter that act as microbial food and just some basic maintenance. In regards to floor drains and unused, maybe like a mother-in-law kitchen or showers, you have to pour water down those drains once or twice a month to refill those P-traps, particularly in drier climates. So if you're Arizona, Utah, and particularly when they're next to heating elements. So if you have a floor drain in a utility closet next to an HVAC, that HVAC kicks on, you're going to dry out that P-trap. So just in making sure that the P-traps are, are, are topped off. 
Another area that Larry mentioned Actinos can be higher is in our sleeping location, bedding, pillows. Wondering what you recommend there. Do you recommend that patients use an ultraviolet mattress vacuum? How often should they change their pillows? Are there specific washing guidelines for bedding? Uh, talk to us a little bit about that area as well. Yeah, so Lori Rossi, who wrote Surviving and Thriving Mold with Paula Better and uh, Cindy Edwards, three, three of my absolute heroes. Those those women are juggernauts in restoring health in the chronically ill with SIRS. Th their book was 2018. I'm going to participate in helping with second edition to make sure we include the actino and endotoxin information. Again, this has all exploded over the last three or four years because we have the technology to evaluate for these things. But Lori just gave me like a mattress encasement link on Amazon. So if someone buys a new mattress, you know, you can let it off gas and all that vacuum it. And then I just put a mattress cover on it that zippers so that you can take the mattress cover off once in a while and throw it in the washing machine. You know, loose number, there's no data on this. I never did any pre and post testing with Larry on this, but I'm thinking like every two to three months for a really in the middle of treatment person once a year for someone who's all done with SIRS. We've been telling people to wash their sheets twice a week if they're going through Actino and daily showers. We've been using the defense soap and I use microfiber washcloths. So we just have patients buy some of those blue or yellow microfiber washcloths from Home Depot or whatever, have them stacked in a dry area of their shower, put a pump of original shower gel from Defense Soap, do their hair, their pits, their groin, their, their toes, everything, let it sit on you for about 60 minutes and then wash it off. If you work out, it's super important to shower within 30 to 60 minutes afterwards. And I'll tell you as a jiu-jitsu player, even from a ringworm and a and a athlete's foot and a, and a staph infection, but also from actinobacteria. Actinobacteria are no different than the bacteria in a hot mayonnaise potato salad and in a summer sun. Heat will will also help. And so does dampness and moisture. So you're sweating, you're growing, your your pits, those areas. And then if I don't, don't like work out hard and then go to bed, you know, you're just going to act, you know, spread all over your sheets. And then the other thing I want to bring up is I don't mind some of these mold branded soaps, but at the end of the day, soap is soap, right? And you should go more for soap because you're intolerant to fragrance or chemically sensitive or something like that. But at the end of the day, what we do is we do half cup to one cup of borax. We have a top loader because front loaders inevitably get mildewy, even though I like that they spin dryness out so you don't need as much dryer, just use a hang cloth. But the new top loaders put in your half cup to cup of borax first, then your detergent. Branch Basics is my favorite for the ultra chemically sensitive. And soap breaks down microbes, right? Whether it's a bacteria or a mold, you're going you're gonna to be able to soap it out. So did I understand correctly that rather than using a washcloth that someone then is leaving in their bath or shower, you were suggesting using the microfiber cloth and then disposing of them? So that this is an anecdotal thing. We never did any like, is a microfiber washcloth better than a cotton cloth that you just sit there? But my thought is that the, the gift of microfiber is it traps, right? So when we do John Banta's cleaning method, which he's extrapolated off some of the asbestos industry and stuff like that, you're using a microfiber. Swiffer's a brand, but there's other microfibers. You're putting a diluted soap spray on there and you're damp wiping a wall. The soap breaks down the microbes, but the microfiber captures it. So mm -hmm. from there, I extrapolated that if I'm going to be scrubbing this, I want to capture that right? One, this is anecdotal, but like I'm thinking about autism kids that were dry brushing, right? For, for stimulation of their parasympathetic nervous system, we're just spreading actinobacteria all over the house. So I'm in a shower and I'm, I'm breaking down microbes and capturing it. Then what I do is I just wring out the cloth. I throw it in our bathtub or in our, we're a healed SERS family. So the wash machine is running every day to every other day. I just throw the washcloth in with my other clothes and then I replace the stack. So, so you don't need to dispose of those. I just don't let them hang out for like three, four, five days. When we talk about mold and mycotoxins, there's always debate about the value of air filters. Are air filters helpful in reducing actinos and endotoxins in the environment? 
Yeah. So I don't have any financial relationship, like any ownership stake in Aeroasis. I adapt, but everyone hears me talk about them all the time. I will tell you when you use aeroasis.com slash Dorninger, Aeroasis does a 25% donation of your total cost after you get a sale to our uh, Roots and Branches charitable fund. And they're freaking amazing. They have shown up for our veterans. They have shown up for police officers. They have shown up for single moms. They showed up for an incredible church that deals with drug addiction, but has beat down air. They, they are incredible people and incredible company. And I love their filter. It's HEPA, charcoal, UV light without uh, ozone off-gassing, a ionization and a, uh, a NASA technology of this foil technology. So it's five filter technology. And that's just the I adapt. I don't recommend the G series because it does give off a little bit of ozone. And the reason we use them is I love that they're good guys, but if their filter sucked, there's no time for my patient's time, money, and energy is because Dr. Shoemaker took a patient with immunoreactivity to actinomycetes on Genie put them into a 12 by 12 room and had three step step ladders. And in each, if for 12 hours, they had the IADAPT small on the, on the bottom rung. Then they, the next 12 hours positioned it on a top rung, the third rung. And then they redid Genie and the immunoreactivity to actinobacteria went away on Genie. They stopped transcribing inflammation to actinobacteria. So they were in like an IADAPT tornado. That is the only filter that we have a micro pilot study on about actinobacteria. So people ask about other filters all the time. And I was like, I don't know, you know, that is a unique five-fold combination in the iAdapt. Would a traditional high-end HEPA filter have done that? Would IQ Air have done that? I don't know. But the iAdapt is showing valuable for actino. We don't have data on endotoxin yet. Uh, there is data on mold. And then they have some data on viruses too. Like there was a 99.99% reduction in MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which is a coronavirus that we should be freaked out about. It's 30% death rate if you get MERS. So, so they have some, some good pilot trials. It is a good part of a home maintenance, I adapt, but it is also something we will consider if a family or a person or a patient is stuck in a building that they can't deal with. Then I'll try and get at least an eye adapt small for their bedroom and not have it the exhaust directly blowing on them because a lot of people don't like to sleep in, in a strong wind, but kind of, they're relatively quiet. And then I'll try and get a medium, a three cube for their living area. And the key thing for any filter you use is that you move it and, and that the filter is strong enough to pull air through it, right? So we get these little molecule like filters, you're not pulling air from the other corner before you even worry about ozone, right? You have to pull air. So even if you have an eye adapter or an IQ air, just move that thing around every 24 to 72 hours. Don't get obsessive about it and make your outlets nice and easy so you can unplug it here and it's Wednesday and I plug it in over there. In our last several minutes together, I want to get some of your thoughts on treatment. You mentioned that cholestyramine and well call still do play a role, even in the actinos and endotoxin conversation. So if someone's not dealing with mold and mycotoxins and are more actino endotoxins, do we know what the cholestyramine and well call are actually binding and improving excretion of in that person? Or is it more that it's helping with the gene expression and the inflammation? Yeah, well, I pulled, we know since before Dr. Schumacher discovered the biotoxin pathway that cholestyramine well call binds endotoxin because he used to use it for Clostridium difficile and, and E. coli. So if, if you just Google tonight cholestyramine endotoxin, you'll see that paper from the 70s. So the answer is, is, is yes to that. Actinobacteria, we just know that the immunoreactivity goes down with cholestyramine well call. So the MAP kinases, and uh, the TGF beta receptor ones neutralize. Marcons and actinomycetes both produce polycyclic ether. And Marcons, as Dr. Shoemaker proved, is a chronic fatiguing organism, but polycyclic ether is a nerve toxin. And PCE can do palpitations and neuropathies. A lot of times it can also do headaches. So think anywhere there's nerves and they can piss off those nerves, right? So we know that you, you're dealing with PCE with both Marcons, and that's why it's so important to be on well-called cholestyramine while you're 
treating Marcon's. You need to grab that PCE that your liver's trying to get rid of and take it to the toilet. And all cholestyramine does is it gets all that biotoxin laden bile in the headlock and takes it to the toilet, right? And then we know that there's vanillomycin in actinomycetes. So I'm really glad you asked this because the toxins in actinos shut down the voltage dependent anion channel, which is the tunnel from your cytosol cell jelly that goes into the mitochondrial fire pit. So what should happen is I eat some food, I raise my glucose, insulin opens my cell, I uptake the insulin and glucose, and now I have a glucose log in my cell jelly. Through aerobic glycolysis, I chop that six carbon glucose into two, three carbon pyruvate, and I need to get it into the mitochondrial fire pit to burn in the presence of an oxygen bellow and crank out 33 to 35 net ATP, chi, prana, money, life force, healing energy, right? No lactic acid metabolic waste product. What happens with biotoxin, ribotoxin, but particularly actino, is that you block the voltage-dependent anion channel. You block the tunnel from the cell jelly into the mitochondrial fire pit. So now you're stuck manufacturing energy outside of the mitochondria, which is wildly ineffective. And for that same six carbon glucose, you make eight ATP plus lactic acid buildup as a waste product. And in highfalutin boulder triathletes, that's called bonking, right? I can't run another step. I've hit lactic threshold, right? The SERS patient gets that walking to the mailbox. So what cholestyramine well call does is it literally is an excavator with a dump truck that removes the ribotoxin biotoxin from the voltage dependent anion channel so that pyruvate can get into the mitochondrial fire pit again. And that stuck pyruvate, two pyruvate or, or one glucose in the cytosol is molecular head metabolism. That's what it is. It's I can't get this into the mitochondrial fire pit to make 33 to 35 uh, units of energy. So do we know what specific biotoxin uh, actinomyces? I have to ask Dr. Shoemaker about that. He might have some insight. I, I don't, I just know that MAP kinases go down, TGF beta receptor ones go down and uh, molecular hype metabolism goes away. You start making energy again. So what mimics actinomycetes in doing that? Iotriconazole, diflucan and fluconazole. So the reason Dr. Schumacher goes so freaking AWOL on don't use azole antifungals is because they block the voltage-dependent anion channel, right? You can, you can Google John Hopkins has an intellectual property rights to using itraconazole as a chemotherapeutic drug because the way you stop cancer cells from reproducing is shut off their energy. But what does that do to your own cells? So iotriconazole also shuts down the VDAC, right? And this is the number one reason we freak out on doctors just throwing people on antifungal nasal sprays when there's nothing to kill. People are just chowing down iotriconazole to kill a mold that doesn't exist. It's not, a, it's not mold growing in your body. I've done tons of mold cultures. I, I worked with HIV patients progressing to AIDS before we had good, high-quality antiretroviral drugs. That was a true mycosis. That was a true IV itraconazole issue, right? And the other reason he hates it is because you get gene transfer where the more you stress bugs with antifungals, the more they outsmart antibiotics, Right. And that's where all of a sudden you start seeing these high rates of vancomycin resistance on Marcon swabs in areas where doctors are using azoles. Right? And that's what doctors shoot. So, so if we want to have, uh, do it for the children, right? We want to have drugs for our children's bugs or grandma who's in the ICU right now. We have to use these meds responsibly. I want to come back to this for a second, treatment wise, from a a skin actino perspective. You mentioned the defense soap. I've seen some topical creams from compounding pharmacies and things of that nature. Are there any other tools topically that you're finding helpful in your patients? Yeah. So I don't know. Dennis Katz, who worked with Dr. Shoemaker on figuring out VIP, vasoactintestinal peptide, is a dear friend of mine. I love those guys at Hopkinton, which which got absorbed by PD Labs and Dennis and Michael Massioni are, are dear friends, talk all the time. And, and it's so great to have a 
brilliant pharmacist in your Rolodex to call and, and shoot the breeze on, on these things. And they were using a cyclobenzaprine witch hazel combo to work on Actino. And some things transitioned in that whole pilot trial kind of fell through the cracks. So I don't know. Yeah, I know that Dr. Shoemaker is using coal tar. We've been using Defense Soap. And I'm going to present, we have a little Actino coffee house coming in for the Shoemaker certified and proficiency partners people that, that I'm going to be presenting this data on. But all we have right now is Defense Soap is statistically significantly radically reducing the P. acnes and the Carinibacterium tubercleostericum. And Dr. Shoemaker saw the similar benefit with Coltar shampoo. When we think about actinos, I've heard Dr. Shoemaker say that actinos are found in the blood. Is there a potential role for systemic antibacterial agents? Uh, what are your thoughts on, on whether or not there's a place for that? I don't know, but now we're into me spending another $20,000 on figuring things out. So we have a handful of people who have clean homes. And we can't get the actinobacteria. So statistically, the defense soap is working. And then we have some outliers. And so what I did for the outliers, I took that skin swab. And again, this is stuff that we're working with, with the patient as an N of one, right? This is anecdotal clinical observations. I don't want doctors out there just, just going willy nilly. But we did the Enviobiomics number 21 skin swab as a Marcon's nasal swab, type nasal swab. And they had high... P. acnes and high carinibacterium tubercleostericum. One of the things that can knock that back is a ZPAC, azithromycin. I was looking up a Chinese study on the cultured P. acnes on Chinese population and did culture and sensitivity and doxycycline, had sensitivity to kill the P. acnes again outside the body, not in vivo. And we know that a lot of our dermatologists will use tetracycline or doxycycline cream for really bad acne, which is often from propionobacterium acnes. So we're figuring this out, Scott. And I, I, a year from now, we're going to have clear thought on this. But at the end of the day, and then lactobacillus acidophilus does have potential outcompeting abilities for uh, actinobacteria. But those are a couple of abstract studies that we're trying to get clinical validation so that we can deliver honest data rather than I had or thought or a feeling in the shower today. You can measure actinovesicles through envirobiomics and yours truly was the first person to pull his blood for actinobacteria. And this all like, like just like with trauma triggering the FKBP5 gene, that can then create inflammation, right? So someone could have told me I'm ugly on Facebook 20 years ago, and I could still have joint pain from that. Like, that's crazy, right? I, I need to go meditate, right? So there's other things that you learn hanging out with the Surzax and Surviving Mold crew and even, even my incredible provider team because they all bring such cool backgrounds and they're so earnest with helping patients. But Jimmy Ryan, is a person I always try and grab lunch or dinner with. And he's the first person who really told me like, dude, blood is not sterile. It's sterile enough. And I'm like, what? I thought it's either sterile or you have a UTI or you're going to pull a blood culture with, with sepsis. No, our immune system is constantly just managing our blood. And it's actinovesicles, almost like a lipopolysaccharide, but from a gram positive, it's these actinovesicles that these little chips of mycolic acid that we're finding in the blood. And we can only do that because we can now run blood through next generation sequencing, NGS testing. And then what to potentially do if they're present? Sounds like that's to be explored. Well, what we're doing as of now, and really the big rub on this is all said and done, a genie, $700 kid, $250 dry ice overnight mail-in, $100 review by Dr. Shoemaker, so on and so forth. You're getting around 1200 bucks on a genie, right? And that's from our clinic who doesn't upcharge labs. If we did this right, we would get funding for 10 pre and post genies to make sure what I'm about to tell you guarantees turning off MAP kinases and TGF beta receptor ones. But as of now, what we're doing is we're cleaning up the building. We're doing some maintenance on sheets, uh, getting some IADAPs in there. 
You're running the Shoemaker protocol, just like ever, you know, remove patient from biotoxin exposure, show me the clearance test. Where's my clean hurts me? Where's my clean actino with the P. acnes and the crinibacterium tuberculosis tericum less than 10,000 on the Swiffer, endotoxin less than 100, enough cholestyramine well call to drain the body's remaining reservoirs by taking the biotoxin toilet, all the funk med and naturopathic medicine we need to make sure that gut is healthy and we're pooping and the liver is and gallbladder are discharging that biotoxin laden bile into the intestinal lumen eradicate marcons. And then if we see lots of atrophy on neuroquant, we're going to do vasoactive intestinal peptide to regrow brains, right? That's what we're doing and it's working. What I'd love to know is, should we consider something like a round of doxy around a ZPAC or high dosing lactobacillus acidophilus? Obviously, as a naturopath, we're using probiotics, we're using antibiotics, we're using probiotics to, to get there quicker, or to totally neutralize it. I mean, we've had a handful of dermatological MRSA cases in our clinic where if there's one cell of MRSA left on your skin, it comes back, right? So at the end of the day, again, postulation, I think we're going to find that managing and overturning the biome is more important than we think. So talking about functional medicine, naturopathic medicine approaches with endotoxins, lipopolysaccharides, there are some practitioners that look at ways to support the lining of the gut to minimize intestinal hyperpermeability, things like bovine immunoglobulins and so on. How important is working on intestinal hyperpermeability or leaky gut to reduce endotoxin transfer from our environment into our gut and potentially into our bloodstream? Yeah, I think it's super important. And my only issue with functional medicine, I obviously do functional medicine. I teach weekends for Apex Energetics and a lot of Dr. Krasian's work. I write some stuff for them, but I don't like the word for what we do at Roots and Branches because we really do diagnostic medicine. And in that therapeutic order, step one of naturopathic medicine is identify and treat underlying causes. And that's a lost art. It's fine to, it's hard to find NDs who want to really wholeheartedly dive in there. I'll give you an example with gut lining in the mid-air. Number two is reestablish healthy regimen. That's diet and lifestyle, right? A good nutritionist can do that. An MD can do that, so on and so forth. Step three is stimulate the vital force. Get some acupuncture. Take the best homeopathic remedy. Jump in a cold river. Wim Hof, breathe. Meditate. All those things are stimulating your innate healing responses. Step four is tonify systems. That is targeted, in our clinic, lab-driven nutraceutical support. Step five is correct structural integrity. I'm good friends with Eric Goodman, who, who created foundation training. Peter Goscue's pain-free work is incredible. There, there's a whole bunch of biomechanic method. Teach the patient how to train the, the muscles to load their bones. Step six is drugs and surgery. We're not anti-drugs and surgery. It just shouldn't be offered as a first resort. So let's talk about what does a gut need? What does an intestinal lining need to heal? What's the number one ingredient? Oxygen. So why aren't you screening the patient for apnea if they have leaky gut, right? What's number two? Fuel. Number one important physical ingredient for physical life is oxygen. Number two is fuel. So if I have insulin insensitivity, if I have hypoglycemia, if I think I'm in ketosis, but I'm not, and that keto mojo meter shows me at 0.7, how am I going to make energy, cash money, ATP to remodel my gut lining? What about electrolytes? How am I going to create ATP without sodium and potassium, right? T3 thyroid hormone. The gastric, gastric ulcers in animal models in hypothyroid are real. And then my anabolics. I need estrogen, progesterone, DHEA, androstenedione, testosterone to rebuild, remodel. And then, yeah, I love me some gut powders, whether it's L-glutamine or DGL powder or some of the bovine immunoglobulins. Uh, we do all that, but you don't want to have do a gut restore cleanse with a gut powder, like an apex for Paravite or uh, a designs for health, um, GI revive, or uh, there's a lot of great brands out there, you know, into best year in the nineties. In I know all the great companies that make great products, but in a 63 year old postmenopausal woman, whose progesterone is 0.1 progesterone helps anabolize and heal the gut. And then I think Dr. Heyman did a really good job really talking about MSH's role in mucosal integrity, not just mucosal immunity, but also mucosal integrity. So if you have SIRS and you're working on leaky gut, but you're not dealing with remove patient from biotoxin exposure, you're putting Band-Aids on a patient. 
And there is a time and a place for that, but just explain it to the patient. If you're not in earnest dealing with the building, don't deal with these patients, right? And that's where my whole spiel for the SIRSAC welcome talk was we need screeners and we need screeners and treaters. So if you're interested in SIRS, but you get overwhelmed by the whole thing, you don't want to talk to a remediator every time you drive home about how they're botching your patient's building, right? Then just do a VCS, do a cluster symptoms, evaluate biotoxin exposure. And if it's there, send to someone that you trust, Shoemaker Certified Clinic, who's not adulterating the Shoemaker Protocol. Call them and say, do you skip steps? Do you bait and switch the Shoemaker Protocol? No? Cool. I can refer to you, right? And let them run, run the protocol. And what we do for a lot of providers, they trust us to not poach their patients, right? Our job is to take a chronically ill person. They're doing a lot of good funk med stuff. They got the dying light stuff. Maybe they screen them for oxygen. Maybe they got them in bioidenticals, whatever deals. Take them in. We deal with the SIRS and then they graduate, right? And they should keep that provider for their PAP and their occasional check-in and their heart scan and, and all the other stuff in healthcare. A couple more questions and then I'll let you go. You've already been super generous with your time. So this next question is from one of our listeners, and that is that actinos release a compound called trimethylamine or TMAO, which can attract other actinos. Some have a condition called trimethylamineuria, where the body is unable to break down these TMAO compounds and release it through sweat or other channels of elimination. So does this potentially make us more susceptible to issues with actinos, either in terms of their ability to colonize our skin or our susceptibility to SIRS when we are exposed? And do you potentially recommend against the use of phosphatidylcholine or choline that could lead to increased TMAO in some patients? It's a great question. The answer is I don't know. The way I would evaluate that is I'd look into TMAO in a patient with actinos. I'd put them on well called cholestyramine and see if those levels reduced. This might be again where we find maybe they need hyperdosing of lactobacillus acidophilus, or maybe they'll need some doxy or ZPAC in the future. We don't know. So it was a really curious question. And then a second question from a listener, what is the role of MASP2 activation from actinos? How does that tie into C4A and potentially ongoing immune activation? Is there a way to reverse MASP2 activation? Is there a place for tools like immune modulators that can help modulate the immune response in SIRS, like, for example, low-dose naltrexone? The latter part of that is very easy. So Louise Carter, bless her heart, she she does collabs in England. So basically, she's dedicated her life to getting the diagnostics necessary for SIRS for England and all of Europe. She did six genies for LDN patients, low-dose naltrexone patients. And what we saw is a reduction in general cytokine production, but no treatment of SIRS. So this kind of made sense to me because in 20 years of clinical practice, I mean, I went to Bastyr in the late 90s, 2003, we were using LDN 20 years ago, and I would have these patients come in with miracle turnaround in their symptoms on LDN, and then other patients who would do nothing for them. You know, we also know that maybe it's a cancer prevention thing for, for people as well, but just from an inflammatory standpoint. And I think if we would have had genies on them, we would have seen that cytokine profiles if they were upregulated, LDN will help those patients. If they're not upregulated, maybe they don't feel some big benefit off of LDN. In regards to MAP kinases and their relationship to C4A, I don't know uh, a specific correlation there, but what I can tell you is when you do the Shoemaker protocol, both come down. So, and we get the proper C4A. Remember, if you're getting LabCorp C4A, don't even bother. They put Futhan in it, which is a preservative that completely changes the science. Dr. Shoemaker ordered C4A and C3A from a woman named Patty. She recently passed three years ago. We call her the queen of compliment, incredible scientist at National Jewish, right? And in certain regions of the country, Quest will courier for National Jewish and other regions they won't. Fortunately, National Jewish is in our backyard, so we can still occur the old way. And I will tell you, when you run a genie, when we have C4A, C3A, when we have MP9, TGF beta, and do the Shoemaker protocol proper, they all normalize. And it's, it's pretty awesome. 
and my understanding is that LabCorp TGF beta one is not not really the place to go anymore either. We have five. We're a Shoemaker certified clinic. We have five people doing SERS cases here. No one that I know orders more TGF beta than us. Freaking LabCorp did not call us to tell us they changed their methodology. And people were popping off. I mean, we're used to seeing a 16,000 or a 7,000 or an either. Out of nowhere, everyone's coming back with like 25,000, 40,000, so on and so forth. We call our LabCorp rep and says, oh, yeah, they changed the methodology. I mean, have the decency to call us and say, just so you know, so you're absolutely right. Quest is still pulling TGF beta. So real quick, if we want to run through that, C4A, C3A is National Jewish and Quest can, can career for that. Uh, TGF beta we're getting through Quest. MMP9 is Quest or LabCorp. Alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone is only LabCorp. Marcons is microbiology DX. ACTH cortisol can be from either. VEGF we're, we're doing from either. ADH osmolality is only LabCorp. Quest switch to copeptin, which is very complicated to to, to switch to the old methodology. And this is the constant battle. My, my wife and I literally put well over one to 200 hours a year on maintaining our right to the diagnostics to figure out patients. And then we try and disseminate that to all the providers willing to take this on. But it's my staff that really deserves that. And it sucked that that happened and no one knew because you just wasted the patient's time, money, and energy on a marker. Yeah, I, I happened to run TGF beta one on myself and suddenly it was much higher, which led me to contacting the Eurofins Viracore people and figuring out that pretty much everything had changed. <laughs> yes. And what's different about you than the majority of us and whether it's not enough time and are all overwhelmed is you called, right? So you should challenge and call every medical director of every lab because CLIA is certified. It just means there's no dog poop and flies around. It doesn't mean that a lab is clinically validated. And that's and that's what's so special about Dr. Shoemaker is he clinically validated the screening, the diagnosis, and the treatment of this illness. My last question is the same for every guest, and that is, what are some of the key things you do on a daily basis in support of your own health? <clears throat> well, I really fell ass backwards into the greatest reason to exist on this planet, which is helping others. So I'm not going to lie, the majority of my life I spend reading papers, coordinating, trying to educate other doctors, talking to mitigators or mediators. And when we get the pop of graduation, it, there's no better feeling on the planet. I like to powder ski, a hot date night's fun. With the wife. Nothing is like seeing the chronically ill get productivity, creativity, life back. So honestly, what I do for a healthy basis is do what I love professionally. And that brings a lot of joy. I love rolling jujitsu. I've always loved the martial arts, but you can train jujitsu and not get kicked in the head and really just get out stress and agitation. I love hanging out with my kids. My younger's into team sports and the big hoops guy. So I play a lot of hoops with him. My older's a parkour guy. Love hanging out with family. I, I make time for God and have him speak into my heart on ego and service and why are we doing all this and remember what's important and money will never fill me up like service does. So just kind of keeping on track with why we're doing all this. And that's about, and that's about it. I love to Wim Hof breathe and cold plunge and do some, some fun stuff like that. But when you take the HLA of 24, 25% of the, uh, of the population has these genes. And I think that's might be underrepresented relative to bigger data sets, but that's on a 10,000 chronically ill and a lot of healthy controls. And you say we have the EPA estimates 50% of the buildings are water damaged. And the last time my wife and I went house shopping, 19 for 19 Boulder homes were water damaged. And we would have to budget like 300 to 500 K to fix them. So we wound up in a new build townhome. That's a hundred million people that are stuck in the rheumatologist and the infertility doc and the psychologist and the psychiatrist and the neurologist and the funk med doc. And we want to continue spending our days changing healthcare from what you have to why you have it and getting everybody access to the underlying causes 
so that they can get accurate treatment plans that restore productivity, creativity, joy, patience, capability in their life. I loved this conversation. My transcriber may quit after they, after they listen to you, but it was so information packed, information dense. Uh, you were super generous with your time and I just really had a fantastic time. So thank you so much for being with us today and sharing a lot of, I'm sure that is not close to all of your knowledge, but definitely appreciate you. I just wanted to say I love your podcast. I view you as a fellow colleague in critically thinking and truth seeking and caring about real bottom barrel answers for the chronically ill. I can see you wear your heart and your brain on your sleeve and you pour your life and soul into helping others and getting accurate information out there. I, I really appreciate what you've done to preserve Dr. Shoemaker's work and also just creating an open platform for any ideas. We're not anti-ideas. We just challenge everything politely because the chronically ill's time, money, and energy are riding on what we're doing in healthcare. So I really am grateful for, for what you put out on the airwaves. Thank you. Thank you so much. To learn more about today's guest, visit drdorninger.com. That's D-R-D-O-R-N-I-N-G-E-R.com. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a positive rating or review as doing so will help the show reach a broader audience. To follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or TikTok, you can find me there as Better Health Guy. If you'd like to support the show, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash donate. To be added to my newsletter, visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash newsletters. This and other episodes can be found on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Amazon Music. Thanks for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit BetterHealthGuy.com.